Let's dig right into the chapter, Matthew chapter 1, or excuse me, chapter 4, verse number 1. The Bible says there in the first verse, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So chapter 4 is really the start of Jesus' ministry. And we're going to continue on, obviously, through the rest of the, the, the book of Matthew. But uh, if you remember, we, we read about the genealogy of Jesus, the birth of Jesus Christ, and then last chapter, Jesus is baptized, and this is highlighting the start of his, his earthly ministry. And chapter 3 basically ended with Jesus Christ's baptism, and now we're starting off with Jesus. The, you know, the very next thing we see is he's being led of the Spirit into the wilderness. So he gets baptized, and now the Spirit is leading him. And I think this is pretty interesting um, because Jesus is being led of the Spirit. And of course, Jesus always follows the Spirit. And anytime he is led of the Spirit, he follows what the Spirit has for him to do. And he's, and he's led basically away from everybody right after his baptism. It says, to be tempted of the devil. So like that was the purpose of him just right off the bat getting tempted right after his baptism. Now, one of the reasons why I think this is so interesting is because even in the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus gives the template to his disciples on how to pray to God, and here's the types of things that you should say, you know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, given respect and regard unto God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation. Like that's one of the things that, that Jesus says we should be asking God. God, please don't lead us into temptation. Well, that's exactly what he was led into here of the Spirit. Now, it doesn't mean that God is wrong or there's anything wrong with God doing this, but it's better to not be led <laughs> into temptation and not to have that. Now, now first of all, just, just get this clear. What says to be tempted of the devil Tempted is really a word that just means like tested or tried. You know, someone wants to find out the truth. Like with God, God has allowed for people in the Bible to be tested, to be tried, where God actually kind of steps back. Maybe there's someone he's been protecting for a long time. He's been hedging them around. And then he just takes a step back and just says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just allow this to happen just to see what's in his heart. Right, just to allow that person to go through a difficult or a trying time as a test. David was, was tempted with, by Satan when, uh, when there was you know, a threat coming against him to number the children of Israel, even though he was forbidden from doing that. It, was, it, it ended up being a sin unto him. He was tested and he, you know, he fell short in that test. Uh, Job was tested. You know, he came through. I think he came through great. You know, he, he kept his integrity. He didn't curse God. He didn't do any of those things that he could have done through that major testing that he went through. Um, and notice with Job, he was, he was tested of the devil too. It was, it was Satan attacking, just like it's Satan going against Jesus Christ here. But when God is allowing the temptation, it's just, he's just letting it happen, right? He's not, God's not bringing the temptation you know, from Satan. He's just, Satan's the one that wants to do it, and it's just the allowance of that to happen. Now, we should not want to go through that and be tested. It's not, it's not something you really want to have to deal with. Um, we pray for God to protect us and, and hedge us about, right? That's, that, that's in our best interest more so than anything, but we have to be prepared because there may be times where we will be tested, we will be tempted, and you want to be able to come through ready for that. This happened to Jesus very early on in his ministry, right after his baptism. You could look at the baptism as, wow, what a great event. I mean, God just got done saying, the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What a, what a great thing. Imagine if, you know, obviously we're not God's only begotten son. But if you left off that first part and just, if, if God were to say something about you, like, wow, I'm really well pleased in you because you've been doing real good. You've been living a great life or whatever, you know, following his commandments and doing so many good things and getting started. And uh, 
when when you have high moments like that oftentimes there will be an attack there will be some type of you know messenger of satan to come and try to try to bring you down a notch and try to just screw up what's going on and it's not that jesus just got saved here with anything jesus didn't need to be saved he was perfect jesus is the son of god but um you oftentimes also find people that you know, maybe shortly after they get saved or shortly after they get in church and kind of get fired up, maybe shortly after they get baptized, we'll start getting the attacks from family or friends or, or whoever, right, from, from anywhere on their faith and, and try to shake them up and, 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 you know, cause them to get out of church, cause them to not do the work and just, because it's a lot easier when people are just getting started to kind of, to mess with them and get them out. And that's what Satan's doing here. Because up to this point, Jesus hadn't been doing the full-blown ministry that he was sent to do. You know, in the, in the in earlier years of his life, he was preparing for it or doing whatever he's doing, but, but this is when his ministry is really starting, when the great work is getting started. And um, Satan wants to prevent that. He wants to stop that. So, um, and he goes to tempt him. So now let's, let's go ahead and look a little bit further into this and into the temptation that Satan brings at him. It says in verse 2, When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. Now, it's a significant event. There's only a few times in the Bible we see people fasting for that long, 40 days and 40 nights. It's a really, really long fast. Um, but based on the fact that it says that he was hungered or you know, he was hungry, I would guess that he was probably just fasting from food, not from food and water. We see people fasting from food and water sometimes. Uh, there's a few, you know, multiple ways that you can fast. But usually, because you're, you're going to be thirsty before you're hungry, when you're withholding from yourself. And you need water more than you need the food, you know, especially over a length of time. Your body needs that water more. So... Um, just the fact that it's mentioning here, well, after the fast, he was hungry, he wasn't thirsty, and that this is what Satan is going to tempt him with, is with the food, not with the water. We could just guess that he's uh, fasting from food. Now, not that that really matters. It's just something, you know, it's kind of notice and point out. It doesn't affect anything doctrinally, what exactly he was fasting from here, but the point is that what Satan's doing here is he's attacking his physical weakness. Look at verse number three. The Bible says, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. So he, he's doing a few things all at the same time here. He's, he's challenging him, right? Well, if, if you really are the Son of God, which God just got done saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then you've got the devil coming along. Well, if you really are the son of God, then, then why don't you do this? Right? Why, don't, why don't you command that these stones be made bread? So one of the things he's doing, it, it's subtle. The way that he's introducing even just the thought of bread during this time where Jesus is fasting. He has a fast going on. And Satan's doing whatever he can to just get Jesus to slip up. And that's just one way of doing it is just saying, well, if you really are this powerful, one, to try to prove that he's the son of God, but two, hey, I know, I know that you're hungry. I know you haven't eaten in 40 days. Here's what I'm going to try to tempt you with. And this is something that Satan loves to do. Satan understands, and we need to be aware of this, and we're going to go through these different temptations and, try and apply it to ourselves because Satan's been around for a really long time. This is why you don't bring railing accusations. This is why you don't, you know, just like the Pentecostals, just try to pick these fights with the devil and, and everything else. Look, we're going we're gonna to do what we're supposed to do, but... Satan is a, is a powerful being that God has created, and he's been around for as long as man has been around for. And the difference is that we come and go, and he has existed that whole time and accumulated knowledge and, and knows a lot about how man works 
and what man's weaknesses are. And as much as we want to think that we're very special and unique, in general, just mankind, every, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Every man has weaknesses that are not new to you or to any other man that Satan knows about. And if it's not one thing, it's another, right? If there's different lusts of the flesh, if it's, you know, whether it be some food lust, some drink lust, you know, drugs, drinking, women, boot, like whatever it is, different things that will appeal to different pe people, he's going to want to try to introduce those things, even just getting you to think about it. See, Jesus was abstaining from the food. He's like, well, why don't you just make these stones bread? And just, just get, him, get his mind even just thinking about it. He didn't even have to put it in front of him. He's just, just, just dropping that seed of the thought of, well, yeah, maybe I can do this. And watch out for those seeds of temptation of, well, hey, what if I were just to stop at that casino? Hey, what if I were just to drop in that bar for a minute? Hey, what if I were just to talk to that girl, that man over there? That, that I'm not married to, even though I'm married. Watch out for those, you know, shut down the thoughts, shut down right away so you don't end up going down that, that, that trail. And that's what Jesus did right here. He shuts down Satan at every instance, and he shuts him down every time with Scripture. If you want to be strong against temptations, if you want to be strong against the wiles of the devil and be able to strengthen yourself to not go down these paths, not go down the wrong path, not fall into the trap that Satan's trying to lead you into, then get yourself strong in the Word of God so that you can have the right answer, so that it can help you to form your decisions and the choices that you make, and you can identify something as being wrong right away. Even though, as you'll see, he tries to use Scripture, he tries to twist things and tries to make things sound right, we need to have the wisdom and the knowledge to not be confused by that, not to be led astray by someone who's lying in wait with cunning craftiness to deceive the simple. We ought to be wise. So when he comes to Jesus about, you know, command these stones be made bread, first of all, he doesn't, even, he doesn't even address that he's being challenged about being the Son of God. That doesn't bother him one bit because he's not proud. If Jesus were proud and just had this, this real proud attitude about him, then that would bother him. And we ought not to have the proud attitude Oh, well, if you're such a Christian, if you're this, if you're that, you know, don't worry about the, the accuser or the tempter that wants to drag you down into, into some name calling or railing or whatever. Don't feel like you have to prove things to people. There are going to be people that are going to lie about you for the name of Christ if you're living godly. In fact, instead of letting that bother you, you should just rejoice. And, and you know what? You don't have to worry about correcting the record and making sure everyone knows, well, oh, what do you mean I'm not the son of God? You know, I'll show you. He didn't have that attitude. We ought to live a life where your works can speak for themselves. Your, your, your attitude, your voice, your communication, the things that you say, the things that you preach, the way that you live your life, let those speak for you. You don't need to tell everybody why they're, you know, correct all their false beliefs about you or whatever. You don't have to, if you did that, you just waste all of your time anyways. And, and definitely don't do it because you got your, your feelings hurt, your pride hurt because someone wants to lie about you or, or rail on you or falsely accuse you, you know what? It's not worth your time. People want to throw your name in the mud? They threw Jesus' name in the mud all the time. What's most important, first and foremost, is that God knows your heart and knows what you're doing. So if you're doing what's right by God, even if everyone around you is going to lie about you and just say things, don't let that bother you. 
Because what one of the things it's trying to do is, is get you to react and get you to do something foolish out of emotion or out of pride or whatever. That's, what, that's one of the things that, that the devil is tempting Jesus with here. Jesus doesn't have to prove to Satan that he's the son of God. He's already going to do all the works for everyone to see. He's going to do what he's supposed to do, what God has told him to do. He doesn't need to take this time and show, show Satan, well, no, I will do this just to see. See, I told you I could do it or whatever. He doesn't need to get in that type of a contest to prove who he is. And then, um, so he answers him here. Look at verse number four. It says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And he rebukes the devil with, you know, the devil's trying to get him to focus on the physical meat, the physical food, because he's physically hungry. But Jesus, in his fast, gives him the spiritual answer saying, you know what? It's not all about the food. I don't need the food. He says, man doesn't live by bread alone. Yeah, we do need to have bread to survive, obviously. He says, but we need to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every word. That's more important. And what Jesus is quoting here is actually found in the Old Testament. Uh, you can turn there if you'd like, otherwise just stay in Matthew. Deuteronomy chapter 8 is where that quotation comes from about man not living by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This is another proof text, by the way, of, of why we believe in one Bible version and why it's so important to use one Bible as your source and to have one final authority for what you believe in because every word of God does matter. And it's not, you know, we can't just be so flippant. And, oh, well, yeah, that says this and this says that. And well, we'll just, you know, somewhere along the way we read them all, we'll figure out what the truth is. No, we need, if, if Jesus is saying that man needs to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, if we need to do that, then, then I, I bet you it exists. He's not telling anyone to do something that, that you can't do. Well, how can, I, how can I live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God if I don't have every word? We do have every word. Deuteronomy 8, verse 2, the Bible says, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee. And notice this too, in Deuteronomy 8, 2, this, was, this wasn't even in my notes. This just popped out of me right now. When God was leading the children of Israel in the wilderness, he was doing that to prove them. And isn't it kind of ironic that Jesus is being proved in the wilderness here by Satan, and he uses a passage to rebuke Satan from when the children of Israel were... <laughs> You know, being proven in the wilderness and, and explaining, you know, hey, this is, this is how they were maintained in the wilderness with the manna. And Jesus ties the two together here. And that comes to mind. And that's how he responds to Satan. It says to, you know, to humble thee, to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart. And that's why God allows, the, you know, the, the things that happen, to know what's in your heart. Do you really, do you really believe or are you just saying that? whether thou wouldest keep his commandments. No, verse 3, And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. This verse was real to Jesus. He was just fasting for 40 days. This verse was real. I mean, the, the truth that comes out of this said, God, God allowed you to, to hunger. God allowed you to, to go through this and to be humbled. He says, to make you know that man doth not live by bread only. 
And Jesus just is fasting for that long. It's real. It's evident to him. Yeah, man doesn't live by bread only. We live by every word of God. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Let that sink home. Oftentimes, I think we allow even just meals to come before the Word of God. And we live in a very blessed, rich society. I mean, most people are getting three, three meals a day and probably some snacks in between. And how often are you, oh, I never had time to read God's Word. Just, well, now it's time to go to sleep. I got to wake up early tomorrow. But you had time to eat three times today. You're feeding your physical body and not even realizing that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We need to view God's word as being that important as the sustenance for your soul. That if you want to keep going and not be malnourished and have the proper nutrition spiritually, you need to be getting it from God's word every day. Not a little, I mean, imagine if you just had a cracker every day and that's all you had. Well, is that your Bible reading? Are you just getting a spiritual cracker? A little, a little Catholic wafer? How well is that going to sustain you on a day-to-day -day basis? It's not. But see, people, if you could see your spiritual body in relation to what the Bible is teaching us here, even just with this analogy of, of bread and the Word of God. I mean, Jesus Christ said, I am the bread of life. How much of that are you getting? How, how does your spiritual body look? Is it emaciated? Where you see the pictures of people in, in starving countries where you could just see their bone and, and, and their flesh? Unfortunately, I think a lot of Christians, that's how they would look. If you could put on glasses and just look with the spiritual lens and see the spiritual body, they'd be emaciated. Because you're hardly getting anything. Because you read your little verse or your proverb of the day and you think that's, that's all you need. No, you need way more than that. And amazingly enough, that's also going to keep you strong in temptation. <laughs> Recognize you need this, this manna, this food from God, and it's going to do a lot of benefit. It's a lot of value. It's going to keep you strong. Right? You want to be strong spiritually, don't you? Well, th think about if you, if you wanted to be strong, if men wanted to be strong to be able to defend themselves and defend their families and ward off evil, are you going to just forsake all food and not exercise and not do anything and allow your body to just shrivel up? Of course not. What are you going to do if you want to be a good protector? You're going, to, you're going to make sure you're eating right. You're going to be working out. You're going to be exercising and doing what you need to do to be strong, to be able then protect from evil. Well, spiritually, we need to do the same thing. You need to be feeding yourself properly. Not only do you need feeding yourself by getting the word of God, you need to be exercising, exercising the faith, putting it into practice, putting it into use, and getting yourself spiritually strong so that you can spiritually protect yourself and your family Amen. and protect yourself from the evil, protect yourself from the temptation, protect yourself from all the sin out in this world. That's what you need. Let's keep going here in Matthew chapter 4. Look at verse number 5. This is the second temptation. The Bible says, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Again, he's calling into question, if thou be the Son of God. And this is an M.O. for Satan, by the way. Well, hath God said? 
and, it, and it's just casting doubt and casting questions on some of the most basic things. Watch out for that. You need to start by getting settled in just fundamental truths. That's why we're, one of the reasons why we're fundamentalists. Let's hold fast to just fundamental doctrines and don't let stupid questions and hypotheticals and just these, these foolish questions overthrow your faith. And just these, you know, that Satan brings up. Because then you say, well, he never proved he was the son of God. I mean, Satan's over here all day long. Say, well, why don't you prove it to him? Why don't you prove it? He didn't have to. And this is unfortunately the same attitude that a lot of foolish people have today. Well, I believe God. He just needs to prove it to me. He, you know, I prayed to God once, and I said, God, if you're real, you know, then just strike lightning right here. Or, you know, like, like commanding God to do something for him to prove that he's real to you. And that didn't happen, so I'm not going to believe in him. Thou fool. You fool. God's not going to just bow to you because you want him to do something to prove that he's real. He's already done enough to prove that he's real. Amen. How about you just start by looking at the creation? Right. It's already done. He doesn't have to do anything special because you asked him to do something special. It's the God of the universe. Amen. You're not the God of him. He doesn't have to prove himself to you. He's already done plenty that's sufficient for anybody to know that he exists. Just like Jesus doesn't have to prove who he is to Satan. Doesn't have to prove it. So what he's trying to do here, though, he brings him up to the top of this temple. And he's basically saying, well, hey, you know, if you're the son of God, why don't you just jump off? Cast yourself down because they're up real high. He's saying, if you're the son of God, you know, but what he's going to saying, well, the Bible says that He's going to give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time they'll dash thy foot against a stone. So he's saying, well, hey, the Bible says God's going to protect you, so why don't you just jump off then? Right? I mean, hey, if you're the son of God, then God will make sure the angels will catch you, and you won't, you won't get hurt at all. You won't even hurt your foot. And that quote, by the way, is from Psalm 91. I'll read that for you. You don't have to turn it if you want to, but um, Jesus answers him in Matthew 4, 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. See, if God's going to lead someone into temptation, that's completely just by God. But we don't tempt God. We're not going to test God's word. Oh, is that really true? And just put that you know, doubt out there. Whatever. Well, I mean, you said he was going to do this. We're not going to do that. It's not right to do that. Jesus said, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So we need to take all of God's word in context. Watch out for someone like Satan ripping out a verse out of context, which is exactly what the Pentecostals, the snake handlers do, because they're just like Satan. Yeah. Oh, well, the Bible says, you know, you're going to handle serpents and you're going to, you know, and, and nothing's going to hurt you. So we're going to just go ahead and drink poison and we're going to do all this stuff because God said he's going to protect us. So and what are they doing? They're tempting God. If they would just read Matthew chapter 4 and, and see what Jesus said about people who did that, you could learn a lot from that. Don't go tempting God. God promises that he'll do something. Let's leave it at that. Let's believe it. But you don't need to go putting yourself in harm's way just, as, just to, to, to prove that God's real and that God's going to keep his promises. Because there's a lot of things that, that God will allow you to go through and still gives you the will to do stuff. And if you're going to be that foolish to put yourself in some stupid situation, there's a big difference between people coming and attacking you for serving God and God protecting you for that and making sure, hey, you know, I'm going to make sure that no one touches mine anointed. Versus... Someone just foolishly going, hey, okay, well, I'm going to take a gun. I'm going to put it to my brain. I'm going to see if I, you know, because the angel's just going to stop it. That's stupidity. I'm going to throw myself off of here because, hey, why not? And, and engage in stupid behavior. And if you read the context, too, it's clear what he's talking about. Psalm 91, verse 9 says, Because thou hast made the Lord, 
which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. So he's saying because, first of all, it starts with you making the Lord thy habitation. Because you have decided to make God your habitation in Psalm 91. Because of that, there shall no evil befall thee. So come on thee, which it would be externally coming on you, not you just saying, well, I'm going to go and do something really stupid. There's going to be no evil befalling thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. They're going to watch over and protect because, because you are making God your habitation. And by making God your habitation, you're going to be walking in his ways which is not, let's just go jump off a building because that's not God's ways. He's not telling us to do that. If he were telling us to do that, then I would say, yeah, okay, we'll trust it. Like when God was telling Abraham to offer up Isaac, his son, God was telling him to do that. That was a direct command from God. And he had faith, and yes, he followed through. And, and God's, you know, obviously, we know that story. He didn't, uh, he didn't end up killing him, but he knew and had faith that God would be able to raise him up again anyways. There's a picture of the resurrection. But God's not telling us to go and step in front of bus and jump off buildings and do anything foolish like that. Let's get back to Matthew 8. Four, let's see this, this third um, temptation here in verse number eight. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. So now he's not, you know, um, challenging that he's the son of God. Now it just comes down to what he really wants anyways. And but notice he's also using another means of, of trying to get to Jesus. So first it was the bread to satisfy his hunger. So now he's trying to get him to, oh, well, how about if I give you riches? How about I, I make you, you know, uh, you, could, uh, you could have all the kingdoms. Look at all the kingdoms of the world. Look at all this. It could all be yours right now. And that is another tactic of the devil, trying to give you the quick and easy answer and just, oh, you can have all this stuff right now. You don't have to wait for it. Jesus knew he's the king of kings and Lord of lords, but it's going to take time to get there. You got to do everything right. But in the end, that's way more valuable than the current you know, situation of the kingdoms on the earth or whatever, even if Satan had the power, which he may have to be able to give Jesus. Right? Let's just say that, that he did have that power to be able to, to do that. Which we know God's all powerful, almighty anyways. But does, you know, just hypothetically speaking, just to say, oh, wow, oh yeah, that looks good. I'm going to take that right away. Nothing compared to what's to come. We need to keep that in mind also. Don't fall for the quick and easy, feel good now. Oh, I want this. Oh, I could come into all this money. All I got to do is just do something kind of shady. All I got to do is just tell this lie. All I got to do is, is, you know, tell this person whatever, you know, steal from someone, whatever, right? All, all I have to do is just this one thing, and I could have all this. No, but that one thing, whether it's bowing down to Satan and worshiping him or stealing or lying or whatever, if it's a sin, hey, you don't do that. It doesn't matter what the wage is, because we know that the wages of sin is death. And that will happen. The, 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 the temporary pleasures of sin, the pleasures of sin for a season, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Don't fall for Satan's lies and his temptations. Verse number 10, Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So again, every single time he's quoting scripture, every single time he's saying why he's not going to do what Satan wants him to do. And if you're going to be strong from temptations and not falling into sin and not getting yourself wrapped up, and you need to be strong in God's word, and you need to be able to say, nope, this is what's right. This is what is right. This is what God said to do, and that's what I'm going to do. 
and it doesn't matter what you're trying to give me. It doesn't matter what you're, you're trying to show me as being this great illusion of sin because I'm going to do what's right. And this is an illusion. If Jesus were, which we know he couldn't and he wouldn't and he didn't, but if he would have like taken Satan up on that, it all would have been destroyed. Everything, would, and which... It, I don't even like to entertain the thought because there's no way Jesus could have done that. He was God. He's not going to do that. He was perfect. But the, the point is, right, let's just say he was replaced with just a regular man and Satan was going to give, the, give him the kingdoms of all the earth. That would be destroyed so fast. You might have some pleasure for some short period of time, but then you'd realize hey, that's not all it's cracked up to be. It'd be gone. And then like, you know, if it was just, just some man that sells his soul to the devil or whatever, you're going to end up spending eternity in hell anyways. It's not worth it. Not worth it. Let's, um, oh, here, uh, look at verse number 11. Then it says, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. This reminded me in James chapter 4, the Bible says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Jesus withstands the devil. Three times he attacks. Three times he's bringing different things at him, trying to get him to be shaken in his faith, trying to get him to do wrong, trying to get him to commit sin. But Jesus resists, he's steadfast, he stands strong, and what happens? The devil leaves. He leaves. He's not going to waste all of his time with someone who is resisting. And this is, this is another important thing to remember, that if you're being attacked, you know, the devil wants to wear you down. Satan wants you to be worn down to then just give in to the temptation. Resist because it will go away. Oftentimes we can, we can get into situations where it's hard to see an end. It's hard to see that things will get better because you're so wrapped up in the moment. You're so wrapped up in maybe how bad things may be or how alluring whatever you're being presented with is. But choose right and stand fast because Satan will then depart. You're not going to be in that position for very long. It will pass and you'll be able to continue to make the right decisions because then, you know what, Satan will just go after someone else. He wants to go after some of the weaker, he wants, uh, there's a, a few ways that Satan targets people. Obviously, he wants to bring people down that are doing a lot for the Lord. But he's not going to just keep butting his head against the wall. He's going to bring his attacks. He's going to bring his temptations. He's going to try to do what he can. But if you stand fast, you know what? He's going to go somewhere else. He's not God. He's not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at one time. So he's going to choose to attack different people. And he can only be in one place at a time. And even his devils that he, that he may be commanding or on his side or whatever... There's still only so many of them. There's only so much they can do, and you resist. And the Bible says, God says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. He'll run away. You don't have to attack him. You just resist and he'll run away. Let's keep reading. And then, of course, after the temptations, then the angels come and they minister unto him. So he was basically left alone to deal with Satan. And we may come across a time in our life where we're left alone for God to try us. Be prepared. Be strong. Be strong in the Word of God to stand strong. And you know what, though? You come through, and God will bless you, and you'll be ministered unto, and you'll be helped, and you'll be provided. It will come. Even in the end, right, when things get really bad in the great tribulation, stay strong to the end. Because when Jesus comes back, that will be your relief. That will be your comfort. That will be, whew, we made it. Don't faint. And the reason why I'm even bringing this up is because this may very well happen in our lifetime. Stand strong. 
Persecution gets stronger, gets harder. Don't back down. Because unless it's the Great Tribulation, you know, Satan's going to flee. And if it is the Great Tribulation, Jesus will come back. And, and, and he'll save you from, from whatever is going on. Look at verse number 12, Matthew 4, 12. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And, uh, and one of the reasons for this, obviously, Jesus is starting his ministry. John's already starting to receive um, this persecution. And it's definitely not Jesus' time yet to, to suffer that same fate. So he leaves that area and moves somewhere else to do, to do his work. He says he leaves Nazareth. He says he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast, in the borders of Zebulun and Nephthalim that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Nephthalim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Isn't it amazing how many times, I mean, we're on, only on Matthew chapter 4, just prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy is just being fulfilled. I mean, this is from Isaiah chapter 9. That's where this quote is from. Just in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9, you've got, I'll read it for you, but it says, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. This is a reference to Jesus Christ coming and shining that glorious light. It was a dark place before he came. There was a lot of darkness kind of ruling and reigning in the land. And then Jesus comes on the scene. He's bringing the gospel. He's bringing the light. The light of God is shining. And there's just one more prophecy just being fulfilled here. And I thank God that we have all of these, these things being brought up. Because I don't know that I would have been able to pick up on all this stuff. But then when it's pointed out, it's like, wow, that's amazing. That's great. That's cool. That's awesome. That is there. That is what that's referring to. And um, there's so many of these going on in Scripture. It's hard to even keep up with it in the New Testament. I can't, you know, you could probably dig into every single one of these in depth. I don't have time to do that through all the, the topics that are covered in these chapters. But even just digging into every single one of these things that are, that are brought up, and these prophecies regarding Jesus Christ, you can just, you could really dig into that and, and talk about, you know, the land of, of Zebulun and Naphtali, um, the people in darkness seeing a great light. There's, there's so much you could go into that and looking in Isaiah chapter 9 and applying that. Um, like I said, we're not going to do that tonight, but I just, I, I decided to mention it. You can write it down. You want to go back and read that more in depth later. Uh, feel free to do so. Let's keep reading here in Matthew 4, though. Verse number 17, the Bible says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Of course, last week we dealt with this subject of repentance. Uh, Jesus is preaching the same thing. Jesus is preaching exactly what John the Baptist was preaching about repentance, about that meaning, hey, change what you believe, put your faith in Christ, because... Kingdom of heaven is at hand. Look at verse number 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, I'm going to park it here just because this is so important. This is why we're a soul-winning church. This is why I think any church, any group of believers, any congregation out there that puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you want to say, I don't know anyone that would say, oh no, we don't want to be followers of Christ. Right? Of course, everyone's saying, well, yeah, we follow Christ. I want to follow Christ. There's people out there that say, well, what do you have to do to be saved? You've got to follow Christ. That'll be their answer. Well, Jesus Christ said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So what is he saying with this? He's promising them an outcome. He's saying, follow me. So if a person is following Jesus, you know what the outcome is going to be? You're going to become a fisher of men. What does it mean to be a fisher of men? Well, they were, fish, they were fishermen themselves of fish, right? They'd go out in a boat, drop the net, and they'd bring up fish. That's what they went. They went out to catch fish. 
Well, fisher of men's going out to catch people. And obviously, you're not catching them to like lock them away somewhere and, and, and put them in jail or put them, you know, no. We're catching souls for Christ. We're going out to, to, to draw people in with the gospel and bring them to Jesus so that their soul can be saved. And, and they're, they're being brought unto Jesus. It's the harvest being brought in. That's what he's illustrating here through being a fisher. Like, yeah, we're going to go out and be a fisher of men. So being a fisher of men, well, these, just like you don't just sit around at the dock waiting for the fish to jump into your bucket, right? If you're a fisher, you need to put effort into it. You need to put work into it. And that comes with following Jesus. Put, your, put the effort in, follow him, do what he does, follow his ways, and he'll make you into a fisher of men. He'll teach you the trade. He'll show you how to go out and bring people to him. And when I find somebody who's not a fisher of men, you know what that tells me? They're not following Jesus. They're not following Jesus. But, but I, do, I go to church every week. I read my Bible. I pray every night. I'm a prayer warrior. Are you a fisher of men? If the answer is no, you're not following Jesus. You can't convince me otherwise. Because then that would make Jesus a liar. If someone could follow Jesus and not be a fisher of men, then what did this really mean? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Look, going to church, praying, being a prayer warrior, those are all good things. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to downplay or, or belittle someone who does those things. But if you're going to say that you follow Jesus, then you better be a fisher of men. Because you really aren't following him. While you may be doing some good things, you're not wholly following Jesus if you're not a fisher of men. And this is why I think it's so important when you're trying to find a church to attend. Go to a church where they're following Jesus. I don't think that's too much to ask. <laughs> they don't have to believe everything the same exact way that we believe it. But you know what? They should probably be following Jesus. They should have the word of God because they understand that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So they're going to have a King James Bible in English. They're going to know the gospel of Jesus Christ because if they don't have that right, then it's not even a real church anyways because a church is a congregation of believers. So you've got to believe the gospel. And if they're following Jesus, then they're going to be fishers of men. Those are the criteria that I use to attend a church. I don't think that's asking a whole lot. And if anyone's going to claim to be a follower of Jesus, you better be a fisher of men. Let's keep reading here in Matthew chapter 4. Look at verse number 20. Look at the response. Did they say, well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to follow you, but I don't, I don't want to be a, a fisher of men. That's not my personality. That's not my gift, Jesus. I'm not good at talking to people. You don't understand. No, it says, and they straightway left their nets and followed him. Would to God that Christians, believers, can hear the call of Jesus, follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men, and they don't even have to think twice about it. I'm going to drop what I'm doing right now. I'm going to go and follow Jesus. Jesus just called, follow me. And they said, okay. Whatever that means. I'm dropping, okay, I'm dropping my net right now. I'm going to follow you. I'm not going to do it later. Well, my shift gets off in uh, two hours. Straightway, they drop their nets. Where you want me, Jesus? Why? Because that's more important. Because they understood man doth not live by bread alone or by fish alone in their case. But think about it. That is their sustenance. They're, that's how they're earning their living. That's how they're going to keep continuing until Jesus says, no, follow me. Then you say, okay. Here I am, Lord, send me. 
They had that attitude. Straightway they left their nets and followed him. Are you a fisher of men today? Jesus wants you to follow. Does Jesus not want you to follow him today? Because I think he wants you to follow him. If you believe Jesus wants you to follow him, I think it's time to start following him. And let him make you a fisher of men. Because he will make you one. I know plenty of people who didn't have the gift, or rather the courage, That's right. to go out and, and speak to people and talk to them about Jesus Christ, because I was one of them. And I know plenty of other people have the same type of story that, you know what, you dread speaking to someone. But you know what, if you're going to follow Jesus, let him make you a fisher of men. Right. And don't fool yourself into thinking you're following Jesus if you're not. Because let him make you the fisher of men. Let him give you the boldness. Let him teach you and show you the way. But you better be willing to offer yourself up to just at least follow him. Okay, Jesus, I'm ready, I'm ready to follow. I'm ready to follow your lead. Please show me. Have that heart. Have that attitude. Jesus, show me what you want me to do. I want to follow you because guaranteed what he's going to do is say, go be a fisher of men. And he will change you to do it if you are willing. You offer up yourself, he will change you. He gets the credit and the glory. He'll get the honor for changing your life. You just have to offer yourself up. Here I am. I'll follow you. Oh, you're going to follow me? Okay, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want other people. God wants his house to be filled. <laughs> The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the only way it's going to happen is my faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He's entrusted us with the gospel of peace. He's given us that job. You're an ambassador for Christ. So he needs you to go out and preach the gospel. Amen. That's his will. I will make you fishers of men. Verse 21, And going on from thence, he saw two other, other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. So now they get the call. Jesus is calling on them, Hey, follow me. Look at the attitude they had. Verse 22, And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. You know, the Bible talks about leaving what you have here, that you wouldn't love your, you know, your, your father or mother or brethren more than Jesus, that you'd, you'd be willing to, to hate them, to do you know, whatever it is for Jesus, willing to give that up for him, and he'll bless you. They were willing to leave their father in the ship. I mean, they're fixing their nets. They're you know, doing their work. But Jesus called them. Jesus had a more important job for them to do. And they weren't going to let anything hold them back. They didn't let their father hold them back. I'm not saying that her father was trying to hold them back. I'm just saying, you know, like, he's calling them. Okay, Dad, well, we have to go. Jesus just called. We have to go. Are you ready? If Jesus calls to do what he has for you to do, and it's not if, because he is calling. And it's all here. So don't confuse what I'm saying. I'm not saying wait for some weird tingling or for some dream or for some voice to speak to you in the night or your phone to ring. Hello? Oh, it's Jesus. No, that's not what I'm talking about. So don't trick yourself and say, well, he hasn't called me yet, so I guess I don't have to do anything. No, he's already put out the call. He's already put out the call. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, read the Bible. Because it's already in here. We have every word of God. Why don't you look and see what the will of God is? It's not going to be very different between anybody. The will of God is the will of God. Obviously, if you're a man or a woman, there's going to be specifics in there for you. But 
It's the will of God. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. This is Jesus' ministry. This is what he was doing. This is what he was working. You were a follower of Jesus. What was he doing? He was teaching. He was preaching. And he was healing. Verse number 24, And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. Now, we're going to see a lot more of this in Jesus' ministry, this healing and people coming to him. And his fame was being spread abroad because he had these great powers. He's the son of God. He's able to heal people, people who have been sick and have problems their entire lives or who are in serious condition. He is healing them. But look in this example right here that we see. Look at the things that people were being healed from. They're pretty bad. They're bringing him people, it says, with divers, diseases, and torments. I mean, people who are tormented by their diseases. I mean, these are real bad. This isn't like people who just caught a cold or a flu. I mean, people were really sick, were really suffering, and, and people who were possessed with devils. I mean, imagine how bad. We know how bad that is. Think about people today that you'd consider to have being possessed with devils. These are people who the world probably would give up on. Man, there's no hope for that guy. Look at him. I mean, they're just being tormented. There's nothing we can do for him. This guy's got devils. This guy's lunatic. That guy's got the palsy. There's nothing we can do for them. But Jesus is able to heal them. Amen. Jesus is able to heal them. Let's not ever forget the healing power of Jesus. And I don't just mean physically. Obviously, this was happening for real. This was happening physically. But a lot of what we're going to see with the healing of Jesus Christ, there's a spiritual application to this. There's a reason why he was healing people. It wasn't just for the, the sake of their flesh being healed. Even though he absolutely did that. He had compassion on people. He cared about people. But he's teaching a greater truth in his ministry of saying, hey, come to Jesus and he can heal you. How much have you sinned in your life? Jesus can heal you. If you come to Jesus, he can heal you. No matter how much you've sinned, Jesus can heal you. Come to him. That's all you got to do. Put your faith in him. Believe on him. And the reason why I want to be so strong and so firm about this message and look at the people, read it again, who have been coming to Jesus, been healed, because we don't ever want to get a mindset and an attitude of a holier than thou and just start lifting up our nose and start accusing everybody of being reprobate and just thinking that everybody, oh, these people can't be saved. Look, there are some people who can't be saved. And the Bible teaches that, and I believe that, and it's a fact. But you know what? Watch out where you draw that line. Obviously, we know people who have their burning and their lust one towards another. That's evident they've already been over, given over to a reprobate mind. So don't think I'm backing down from that because I'm not backing down from that at all, and I never will because it's what the Bible teaches. But just be careful about who you're starting to label, and you want to bring up all this evidence, and they do this, and they do that. And they, look, you're not going to be able to know Everyone that's reprobate, and we see a lot of examples here, and I always use the Apostle Paul, I think, as a great example. If the Apostle Paul, before he got saved, Saul of Tarsus was walking around today, and he's attacking churches, and he's doing all this stuff, would you call him a reprobate? Would you say, well, I'm not going to preach the gospel of that guy. There's no hope for him. Because he got saved. He may have been chief among sinners, but I think that also goes to, to show a point. Jesus is healing people who were possessed with devils. There are people who had devils. We see all throughout Scripture that get saved. What about the guy among the tombs cutting himself, right? You say, oh, that guy worships Satan. He was healed. He had the devils cast out of him. And what is that picturing? That's picturing their salvation. 
And with that guy, I think that guy really did get saved where, where Jesus comes across the sea and the, the, the men meet him with the, you know, out of the tombs and, the, and the, you know, the devils get cast out of him and, and he's sitting in his right mind and then he wants to go and follow Jesus. I think that guy really did get saved. Not just had devils cast out. I think he put his faith in Christ. But regardless, all these things are teaching, hey, Jesus can heal from even the worst of conditions. Let's not forget that. Take that to heart. Because what you see, other than Jesus dealing with the Pharisees and the few people that, that you know, were these false teacher reprobate type people, he's broadly healing and preaching his message. There were just a few that, that couldn't believe. But don't ever let yourself get to a point, especially as you start maybe cleaning up your own life and getting more spiritual and getting, and getting more sin out of your life and, and, and getting more conformed to the way that God would have you, just physically speaking. Don't let that get to your head and forget that you're just flesh too and that these people, you know what? They need healing. And none of us, is, I mean, watch out if you start to have that attitude because that's just pride anyways. You know, let every man take heed lest he fall because you don't, you, pride goeth before destruction. And if you think you're that righteous and that great that you can't even talk to people, watch out. Watch out. Give people the benefit of the doubt as much as possible right. and preach the gospel to, to every creature. I mean, there's people I walk away from after trying to give a gospel. I'm like, you know what? That guy was probably a sodomite, but I don't know for sure. And if I don't know for sure, you better believe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt to give him the gospel. Right. And we need to maintain that attitude. And, even, and, don't, and don't give up on someone just because they may, have, they may be in horrible conditions. Oh, that person's not ready to get saved. No, they actually are ready. I mean, they need to get saved. And, and you know, don't, don't have that attitude. Jesus can save out of, out of anything. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much for, for everything, for, for your words, for the instruction that we receive here. Thank you for preserving your word. God, I pray that you please help us to put a priority on your word, on receiving your word. God, nourish us, nourish us, nourish us spiritually, Lord, and help us to uh, be strengthened and um, to exercise our faith, to preach the gospel, Lord, to be true followers of you. Lord, we love you and we just ask you to, to please help us and to strengthen us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.